Hi, I'm former State Senator Scott Howe, and I'm here today with some of Salt Lake's youngest residents to talk about this great city. Kate, what do you like most about Salt Lake City? Utah Utes. Jeff, what do you like most about Salt Lake City? Farmer's Market. Farmer's Market and Pioneer Park. What do you like most about Salt Lake City? Good places for us. City Creek and wonderful shopping. Neil, what do you like most about Salt Lake City? Transportation. Transportation tracks. Ellie, if there's one thing that Aaron Mendenhall can help you out on the most, what would that be? That would be clean air because bad air is bad for all of us. That's why we support Mayor Mendenhall. I think Salt Lake City is great because there are so many beautiful cultures and identities. It brings a richness of color, language, and ways of being that make us better and stronger. What I think makes Salt Lake City great is a community that cares deeply about other people and that loves the outdoors and wants to protect it. What I like about Salt Lake City is that we are small lake city. We're just the right size to get to know a lot of different Salt Lakers and they're pretty funky and brilliant. What I hope for our future is that we are a sanctuary for the most vulnerable, an incubator for the creative, and stewards of our beautiful lands. Salt Lake City is a warm, caring, generous, and redemptive community. It's unlike any other city I've ever been familiar with before. My hope for the future is that all of us continue to unite so we can develop comprehensive solutions to the challenges this city faces going forward. I love Salt Lake City because it's the only city in the country where you can walk out your front door in the morning and head to the trails and later that same day you can walk out your front door and head right downtown and catch a great show. There's no other city like it. I think that Salt Lake City is great because it's full of opportunities in business, in education, and in the unique political opportunities to volunteer and be involved with the many issues facing Utah. My hope for the future is that Salt Lake City continues to grow in diversity and that those at the helm listen to community members about the many issues that need to be resolved in and around the city. My hope for the future of Salt Lake is that we will grow in really meaningful ways, that we won't just imitate things that have been done in other places, but when it comes to solving problems like homelessness, climate issues, preserving our natural resources, uh, diversity and inclusion, that we will capitalize on the strength, the resiliency, the intelligence, the creativity of our constituency, on the remarkableness of our natural landscape, and that we will find solutions that create a hopeful place for all people who want to call Salt Lake City home. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. It's so great to see almost every seat filled and so many communities and our citywide community represented here tonight. Um, I'm grateful for all of you for taking the time on a Monday night to be here with us. I want to give a special thanks to all of the city staff who are here tonight. I see economic development, um, our community and neighborhood, Salt Lake City Police Department, 911 Dispatch, uh, Public Services, our Fire Department, Finance, the Airport, Sustainability is here tonight, the City Council is here tonight, thank you for being here, and my team from the Mayor's Office as well who helped to put this together. I also want to recognize our former Mayor Ted Wilson and his lovely wife Holly Mullen in the audience tonight. I want, I want you all to know, to our city team, how proud I am to work with you each and every day and watch you do the work that you do. Your love for this city is incredible. And I'm excited to spend the next four years working shoulder to shoulder with you. I also want to recognize that this evening that Salt Lake City sits on the land of indigenous people of Utah. And we acknowledge that this ancestral territory uh, tonight of many Native American tribes. Can we get a round of applause though for our Meadowlark Elementary hosts tonight? I'm grateful, I'm grateful that they are so generous to host us at their beautiful brand new school tonight. Meadowlark students are a truly impressive bunch. 69% uh, of Meadowlark students are English learners. 70% are kids of color. 
In total, Meadowlark students speak 23 languages. They are the future of our city. It's a city that's growing and that's changing. A city that looks different today than when we were kids, and which will certainly and most surely look different when Meadowlark students are looking back on their childhood years from now. It's our mandate as a city today to build a foundation for them to really thrive as they evolve into the leaders of tomorrow. The great people working for our city today do their jobs because they love this place too. And in 2019, we accomplished some great things. We saw companies invest more than $50 million in our city, into our city, and support uh, the growth of nearly 1,500 new jobs. Four housing developments broke ground utilizing Salt Lake City Redevelopment Agency dollars and programs, and the city deployed its first loan for an affordable housing development in a HUD-designated area of high opportunity. We doubled the number of road lanes that we repaired last year. We opened two homeless resource centers to assist 160 men and 240 women. We enhanced the transportation capabilities with new circulator buses in the city, which is part of our frequent transit network. We did a lot in 2019, but I'm not here to look back tonight. I'm here to tell you that we are ready to kick things into high gear as a city. From the moment that I won the election of mayor of this city, I, and really every day since, I have woken up excited to get to work. It's an excitement that comes from knowing our collective potential and feeling the willingness of our community to get innovative and to do the work of taking Salt Lake City forward together. Together we've finalized short and long-term plans and tonight I'm excited to share with you some of what the future of Salt Lake City looks like. It's green. It has to be green. We have a global responsibility. There's that collective momentum again. We have a global responsibility to address the factors that contribute to climate change from every possible angle that we can now. We have only 10 years to make massive changes to our carbon emissions in order to sustain only moderate impacts of global climate change. We have to do everything we can while we still have the ability to make an impact. Our path forward lies in reducing and improving emission sources that already exist, ensuring the growth that we know is coming is green, and partnering with communities and our residents to enhance our environmental actions together. By my 100th day in office, April 16th, Salt Lake City will reestablish and enforce a city policy that every operational decision we make is viewed through the lens of sustainability. Every fleet vehicle we purchase, every HVAC system we update, every memo we print will adhere to new standards and a new way of thinking for this city. And by this time next year, our city will have completed a substantive review of our regulations and our policies for sustainability practices. We'll be examining and updating our ordinances to ensure that they meet our sustainability goals and developing a sustainability plan that includes goals for each department, mechanisms for accountability, and oversight to ensure that the goals are met. We're going after our carbon output in a big way. And we'll also be investing in carbon drawdown efforts through preserving our natural spaces, planting more trees, and exploring carbon sequestration practices on vacant city land and through sustainable development of infrastructure projects. Our city's continued growth and economic development really hinges on our willingness to make the environment our priority, to show that our residents' ability to breathe clean air is something that we will defend with our actions and our investments as a city. To protect the people, <laughs> Well, I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> to protect the people who live in our city and to ensure that our city's ability to progress and thrive, I'm prepared to take some bold action. To start, 
any development that the city has a hand in should match our environmental practices. To ensure that, this year we will draft an ordinance to send to the City Council requiring any new building funded with city money to be all electric and emission free by 2023. We'll also bring to the council a policy requ requiring all new construction to be solar and electric vehicle ready. If you, yeah, all those EV drivers out there, I appreciate it. If you wanna build in Salt Lake City and you want our help in doing so, you really must be an active participant in our work to address climate change. I'm also pushing hard to transition our city's electricity to 100% net renewable as soon as possible. Our sustainability department has been hard at work to meet an aggressive timeline, and it's leading out on behalf of our residents and cities across the state that have enlisted in the Community Renewable Energy Act, which was passed during last year's legislative session. Our city is leading this multi-year effort to create the program for cities that want 100% net renewable energy like we do, so that we can help reduce carbon emissions across the state. We know Salt Lake City's air doesn't exist in a bubble. That's why it's so important that we work with every city in the state that wants clean air and renewable energy for all. When we talk about Salt Lake City's future as a place that's making tangible environmental progress in the face of a global climate crisis, we can't shy away from frank and honest conversation and dialogue about the inland port and its potential to negate our good work. The port is coming, and it's a reality that future de generations of Salt Lake City residents will live with long after you and I are gone. That's why it's imperative that we are ambitious, direct, and diligent in working to ensure the best possible outcome for Salt Lake City, and that those outcomes are assured to us in perpetuity. We negotiated vast improvements to the Inland Port Statute through HB 347 that's now working its way through the state legislature this session. Should this bill pass, the removal of the Inland Port Authority's potential to override our city's land use policies and decisions will close a massive loophole that's been a major environmental threat. The return of 25% of future tax increment is another big win that gives me confidence that you and I, as our current taxpayers, are not going to shoulder the burden of services for the Inland Port Authority's nearly 16,000 acres of our city. These are big improvements, not only for Salt Lake City, but for the other 248 cities and towns in the state that could be impacted by this statute. But there are still environmental assurances we must have in order for this development, for the development of the Inland Port to be anywhere near acceptable. There will likely be legislative changes to the Inland Port State Statute every year for decades to come. Though the state statute, or the statute before the legislature in this session is far better than what they began with in 2018, we can't have great confidence in a statute that can be amended every legislative session. That's why I have and I will continue to pursue assurances through a contract that would guarantee inland port de development is perpetually leading edge with social and environmental goals. We have some of the worst air quality in the nation and our west side neighborhoods already shoulder a bigger burden of, of pollution than any other part of our city. An inland port in this city must be carbon neutral. It must not be a burden on the community it resides in. And it must be the cleanest inland port in the world. How the inland port happens is the work that we must be engaged in. I am optimistically committed to this work. And I ask you, Salt Lake City, help us define the way to achieve the cleanest port in the world. We can't afford anything less. Our work toward a clean environment isn't done in a vacuum. And as we ask our residents to come together to make a meaningful impact on this issue, we have to create support networks for our environmental stewardship as a city 
and as residents. It should be easier for people of our city to buy fresh produce and then compost what remains of it. It, it should be easier for us to recycle knowing that waste makes it into the right place after it gets in the blue bin. To get a, it should be easier to get on tracks or take a bus and reach your destination in a timely manner and to enjoy all the benefits that come with the shade of a tree or the close proximity of a green and open space. To guarantee these things, we have to think outside the box and try new ways of being, commuters, consumers, even citizens. It's in the moments when we start with a small step and we allow that vulnerability that we are able to impact the tides we're trying to turn. There are opportunities ahead of us to do the right thing environmentally, to strengthen our economy at the same time, and have the outcomes raise the quality of life for everyone in Salt Lake City. I like to joke that we get a thousand good ideas a day in City Hall, and it's nearly true. There are so many good ideas coming our way. One of these came during my campaign when the biggest University of Utah fan and my friend from the League of Cities and Towns, Cameron Deal, said he had an idea. So you see, Cameron and his wife and their young daughter are downtown residents, and they take the tracks to every U of U football game, and they love it. They don't have to worry about parking. Uh, the train system is speedy, and the best thing is that the ticket is free. Their transit is free. And so we thought, why not make an opportunity available to all our major events in our city? Make every ticket a transit pass. I made a promise when I campaigned that I would convene a group of stakeholders during my first 100 days in office to try to get this idea off the ground. But sometimes an idea is so right that it happens faster and easier than anyone could have guessed. Tonight, I am excited to announce to you that Tickets for Transit is coming. Beginning April 4th, <laughs> beginning April 4th, every ticket for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints 190th Annual General Conference will also be a ticket for public transportation. I know, I'll clap for that one. We're in final negotiations right now, and both sides are committed, UTA and the church, to ensuring that over 100,000 people will have the opportunity that weekend to ditch their car, save on the rideshare fare, and make their way to Temple Square on UTA. It's just the beginning. Last Thursday, our team met with a really incredible group of representation from UTA, the church, Salt Lake County, the Larry H. Miller Group, the Utah State Fair Park, and the University of Utah to talk about what comes next. And we are happy to report that every person in that room was excited about and interested in learning more about the logistics of this program and how it happens on April 4th and 5th. That will help us make dramatic shifts that we need to in moving people out of cars and onto public transit in Salt Lake City. Thank you, Cameron, for your incredible idea. This is about air quality, but it's also about our economy, and it's about quality of life. We are growing in every way as a city, and great cities around the world grow public transportation while they grow a population. We can't stop there with public transit. With a population expected to double in the next 30 years and a system of roads that will be unable to accommodate those numbers, now is the time for us to prepare with a robust transit system that can carry the population of the future and today where we need to go. Tonight, I am pleased to also announce that this April, on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, Salt Lake City will kick off its 1,000 Trees Initiative. Each year, Salt Lake City's Urban Forestry Department plants about 1,000 trees throughout our city. But it works, um, it works out to be merely a balance a maintenance effort that only stems the loss of about 1,000 trees each year across our city. 
Until this year, we've basically been breaking even at best on our urban forest. With a thousand additional trees, we'll be growing our urban forest for the first time in too many years. And by planting these additional trees on our city's west side communities, we're not only taking aim at improving the environment, although that will be a great outcome of this effort, we're addressing a geographic inequity that's been allowed to exist in a portion of our city for far too long. For our residents who live here in this beautiful and friendly and diverse area of our city, these trees might mean beautification or a lower cooling bill during hot summer months. They may mean a shady place to have a family outing or perhaps higher property values. But they will also surely mean a narrowing of an existing and now an acknowledged and an addressed gap between the places we live in the city and how our neighborhoods look. I want this to be a community building project. Come help us plant a tree this year and connect with our community. We've had a huge spectrum of people and partners who have been inspired by this initiative so far, from corporate partners like the Ivory Foundation to individuals like the formerly incarcerated man who now owns his own business in Salt Lake City to the University of Utah, college professor and lifelong Rose Park resident, or the new mom I met all during my office hours who all want to give back through planting trees. Please stay tuned. We will have more information on how you can help in these weeks to come leading up to Earth Day. About those thousand trees that we lose every year, uh, they account for about 2.5 million pounds of wood that almost all ends up in our landfill. So we're going to do something new and exciting with that too. Very soon, I'll be proposing an urban wood re reutilization program with the City Forestry Division that will not only divert waste from our landfill, but put that walnut and oak cherry wood and the burls of other beautiful woods into the hands of people who can use it like artists and carpenters in our city. This wood reutilization program. <laughs> this bowl was made from one of the trees that came down in the spring snowstorm last year uh, by one of our urban foresters on, as, as a hobby and a gift to me. And I, it symbolizes for me the potential of the wood that goes to our landfill today. Uh, this urban wood reutilization program bookended by our new program to grow our urban forest by planting the, tr by planting the trees from seed really, will make our urban forestry program a 360 degree enterprise for the first time ever. Growing trees from seed, planting them, caring for them, and ultimately reutilizing the wood at the end of the tree's life cycle. This holistic approach is illustrative of how our city aims to approach all of the work we do. Today, today our city is growing and not just trees. We're on the precipice of incredible change and progress. But this growth isn't going to just happen to us. This growth, this is growth that we are going to shape, that we are going to drive, and that we, we're going to use to create a thriving quality of life and economy for our city for generations to come. We have the unique opportunity right now to harness growth for our good. And we're going to start by dedicating our government resources to ensuring that our growth benefits everyone in Salt Lake City. This work starts with our city's ability to efficiently handle the development that's happening. So in the coming months, we will create a strategy for restructuring our internal departments and processes so we can eliminate barriers, streamline decision making, and break down silos that exist today. One shift we're ready to make right now is putting our economic development loan fund into the economic, economic development department instead of housing and neighborhood development so that we can increase our efficiency in investing, investing city dollars into smart business development. Pending city council approval, the Economic Development Department will also expand 
to include a new tech officer position tasked with coordinating and driving development and redevelopment strategy with tech nodes in the city. Through our work to build Tech Lake City, we are working to define a biotech corridor that runs approximately along 300 west from about the Warm Springs to the Gateway. There's already incredible biotech work happening in that area, largely unrecognized. But by designating an intentional space within our city, we can achieve our vision of supporting a local industry that helps grow our economy, creates excellent opportunities for our workforce, and cultivates the creative energy and advancements necessary to produce modern medical solutions for an evolving landscape of needs. We find ourselves today grappling as a country, as a world, with the realities of new diseases that we don't yet have answers for. By carving out a space for biotech and creating lab space within our city where life science startups and businesses can grow, Salt Lake City and our partners will be prepared so that ours, as our worldwide medical needs continue to transform, we are growing solutions right alongside. Our focus on growing Tech Lake City will not stop at corridors. This industry, as its impact and its workforce grow in the state every year, will become a foundational component of Salt Lake City's broad economy and culture. Our growth as a city will continue as we creatively invest in and enhance some of Salt Lake City's most storied focal points. Utah's capital city has forged a historic bond with our national pastime. And we're fortunate to have a beautiful ballpark embedded within one of our historic neighborhoods. Smith's Ballpark is both a busy regional sports facility and the keystone for our ballpark community. Did you know that Salt Lakers have been playing ball on that field for over 100 years? Through a thoughtful approach that will involve partnerships and community collaboration, our city will invest in a ballpark district that once complete will feature vibrant and positively engaging additions to the neighborhood while implementing a perpetual care for the ballpark itself. Not far from the ballpark sits the fleet block between 8th and 9th South and 3rd and 4th West. For too many years and far too many mayoral administrations, the fleet block has sat vacant and blighted. We are done waiting to develop and invest in this nearly nine acre asset. I, I'll applaud for that all by myself. <laughs> What an opportunity. It is a completely unique opportunity for our city, maybe for any capital city, uh, that's been sitting in our hands. The entire greenery neighborhood so close to downtown is ready to be reimagined. Thanks to an opportunity zone overlay, investors around the world have noticed this, and there are hundreds of millions of dollars in capital flowing into the greenery district as a whole. This area is truly about to blast off, and Salt Lake City has the opportunity to preserve and define its character and set an intention of creativity and innovation for the entire district. We will put a stake in the ground at the Fleet Block for the Granary District, and in doing so, we're creating a bridge between our downtown core and its soon-to-be companion as an epicenter for culture, art, food, and innovation in our city. We're already in the process of collaborating with our design team on this exciting project, so stay tuned because the reimagined fleet block is coming. And as we look at and invest in our growth opportunities, so must we invest in protecting our ability to grow. As strong as our economy has been over the past many years, we know even today how fragile things can become due to unforeseen circumstances. Salt Lake City's financial house is in order, and it will be prepared for an economic downturn. We want our employees and our residents to feel confident that our city will remain resilient through hard times. 
We've already begun the work of an internal risk assessment to plan for the inevitable and ensure that Salt Lake City continues to thrive, rain or shine. Times of incredible growth and a bustling economy as we have today can make it easy to overlook areas of inequity. But our city cannot thrive truly when many of us struggle. In no place are these struggles more visible in Salt Lake City than in our shortage of affordable housing and in our population of people experiencing homelessness. We have made considerable progress on affordable housing projects over the course of the last year with the addition of 751 affordable units just last year, but it isn't enough. The demand for housing that is affordable for individuals and families at all income levels is greater than our current pace of growth, and it's time to approach this problem with even more focus and creativity. Paying for a roof over your head shouldn't mean that you cannot afford to put food on your table or visit a doctor. Having a home should not come at the sacrifice of life's other essential needs. Over the course of this next year, Salt Lake City will add more than 2,100 housing units that are affordable to people at less than 100% of the area median income. Before the summer, Salt Lake City will consider changes to our zoning that will further support the construction of affordable housing, including modifications to shared housing, formerly known as single room occupancy, and an affordable housing overlay zone. We'll also begin modifying density requirements and adding density bonuses for preserving existing housing supply. Our city is invested in moving forward in the creation of diverse housing types. We will identify new ways of partnering and incorporating housing into development that also includes other elements essential to living affordably and efficiently, like childcare, grocery stores, and transit stops. Access to housing that works for every budget is crucial as we foster growth in a way that maintains diversity and the character of our established neighborhoods. To that end, we are committing to undertake a citywide equity plan to address systematic inequities and support opportunities for all our residents to thrive. The availability of affordable places to live gives us more runway to continue a housing-focused approach to homelessness. But while we know housing-focused models work and they provide necessary stability to a segment of the people who experience homelessness, it doesn't work for everyone, as we still see people living unsheltered. And that is because homeless is not, homelessness is not a singular issue, and it can be complex. People become and stay homeless for a variety of reasons. The uniqueness of each person's journey and needs has led us as a city, a county, and a state to an entirely new approach of serving individuals experiencing homelessness. This is a period of significant transition we're in, with three homeless resource centers now online and the closure and demolition of our downtown shelter in our city's Rio Grande neighborhood. In my first month in office, we implemented some short-term strategies to address some gaps in the system. And as a community, we welcomed the Sugar House Temporary Shelter. But now is the time to focus on the long-term by getting strategic about prevention increasing our capabilities to help divert people quickly out of shelter and into safe housing, and supporting those who find themselves chronically homeless with the solutions they need. To start, we should be learning directly from people experiencing homelessness and engaging them on solutions that they need. Their firsthand experience is key to understanding and providing adequate services to impact this dynamic issue and we're going to create a channel for that insight to come. We are exploring ways to create ongoing feedback and engagement forums with our community members experiencing homelessness. In the next year, we will work on short, medium, and long-term plans 
for addressing the funding, the governance, and the accessibility of homeless services. We will explore the opportunity of managed tiny home communities, a model that is finding success in other parts of the country at creating housing, permanent supportive housing opportunities for people who were previously experiencing chronic homelessness. We're also working with service providers and stakeholders on how we can better communicate to individuals experiencing homelessness about the services available to them. This need is particularly acute for the unsheltered, who may not be taking advantage of the services available for many complex reasons. But this work must also come with the acknowledgement that there will always be a population of people for who various reasons will become homeless or remain homeless. For those that seek it, we must have shelter available. And for those who may not engage with the current systems in place, we must work together, cities, counties, and our state, our valued partners, to develop a plan that addresses the unique needs of shelter-resistant individuals. Cities around the country are facing this same challenge as well. We are not alone, and we can learn from the creative failures and successes of other cities in the United States. And we, Salt Lake City, we will leave no stone unturned as we seek our own creative solutions from shared housing to tiny homes that give everyone a place to call their own in a healthy and supportive community. A growing and changing city can also mean uncertainty for people who have made Salt Lake City their lifelong homes and who have played an important role, really, in weaving the unique tapestry of our city's diverse and historic neighborhoods. Being concerned about the displacement of people and businesses from neighborhoods is completely understandable, given what we see is happening in growing cities throughout our country. Community-engaged development is the only way forward if we want to be certain that our collective growth is inclusive and equitable. Over this next year, we will begin work on a comprehensive plan to protect our neighborhoods and local businesses from growth that threatens to displace them. Our residents and our neighborhoods will help define those efforts to strengthen historically resilient and historically underserved areas of our community. And we'll move forward, we will move forward in lockstep with communities to support people and cultures throughout the city. Part of the character and the culture of any neighborhood includes the arts. Investing in the arts pays huge dividends. It helps create a sense of place, belonging, pride, and a connection to where we live. Unfortunately, art is seen all too often as something that's easy to cut. It's seen as an extra, not as a key player. Salt Lake City, will con we will strengthen our commitment to public art and access to the arts by exploring new ways to get art into our public spaces from alleyways, overpasses and underpasses to park strips. We're refreshing our business and cultural districts with the goal of celebrating the cohesive and iconic places in our city. And we'll also be launching a city rebranding effort this year, and the arts will play a starring role. I want to close tonight by emphasizing a theme and a critical issue I've touched on tonight that we need to face together as a community, which is equity, inclusion, and belonging in our city. As I was preparing in November and December to take office, I was fortunate to have some of the best and most highly skilled community leaders advise me on the issues of geographic equity, inclusion, and belonging. Uh, I want to thank Kilo Zamora, Nubia Pena, Stacy Adams, and Marianne Villarreal for doing that leadership work. In their report, they said, we have an opportunity to change the practice of engagement with underserved communities from the beginning and set a tone for being honest and accessible, even when there are painful but needed areas for improvement and growth. In Salt Lake City, 
we are ready to do the daily work of facing what is unjust and inequitable. As mayor, I am committed to making city departments and divisions that are more equitable and inclusive. This will not be a single stroke of the pen effort or we would have done it already. My administration, on the advice of the Transition Committee, has already begun work to strengthen the city's Human Rights Commission. The Human Rights Commission and the city's Disability Advisory Council must be able to help us create and ensure that every operational decision is underpinned by equity and inclusiveness. As the city, as the capital city of a state that ranks last in the nation for equity for women, we will conduct a comprehensive assessment and refresh to our HR practices to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion in hiring, retention, and our compensation. And we'll be investing in the development of a citywide equity plan so that as we are making policy, programmatic, and financial decisions, we are taking into account how those decisions impact all the people in our city. Making a place for diverse perspectives in positions of influence is essential to ensuring new policies are inclusive of the needs of all populations and help to shape an equitable and inclusive city where all individuals can feel welcome, respected, supported, and safe. Being able to wholly support the diverse needs of Salt Lake City's residents is at the forefront of my mind. And we're taking steps now to improve the ways in which historically marginalized communities interact with City Hall. I've already requested that my administration ensure that we have a comprehensive Spanish speaking and translation resources in place to support our residents' needs and business development during every stage of the process. And as we, <laughs> and as we look to the future, we are working on shifting our city's budgeting process to a participatory budgeting system, which would allow all residents to give feedback on where you want us to spend and balance your taxpayer dollars. This will help establish a more inclusive and accessible budget process to gather feedback from all city residents by engaging them where and how they feel most comfortable. We will get to where we want by being transparent, open to change, and doing the work each day together. There is so much to be proud of in Salt Lake City. Our city is an incredible place full of diversity, creativity, innovation, and really a passion for this place that we all call home. The best thing so far about being mayor of the city is how closely I get to work with the people I serve. Not like senator or president, no offense guys. I get to be on the ground working with our community side by side for the people I work for. And when I'm out there, there's an energy that I feel from our neighbors. It's pride for the progress that we've made so far and really for the great things that we have done together and will do. But it's an enthusiasm for everything that's ahead of us. We're going to keep growing, keep welcoming new people into our neighborhoods and our lives. New buildings will color our skyline. New services will help people progress. Businesses will open their doors in our city and people will thrive with new employment. Together we will make progress on the air we breathe in the environment we all want to protect. Together we'll take steps today that guarantee our city is ready for the next generation to succeed. I'm ready for us to do this work together. Thank you for being here tonight.